Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Lauren Gizzi. Lauren is a safety supervisor at Assurance with more than eight years of industry experience. An expert in the staffing industry, she works closely with her clients to establish effective safety programs that achieve measurable results. Lauren takes her uh, personalized approach when working with clients to form valuable relationships that allow her to serve as a trusted advocate. She understands that staffing is a fast-paced industry and strives to achieve customized, practical solutions that provide an overall program that is easy to manage. Assurance is among the largest and most awarded independent insurance brokerages in the United States a top 50 independent broker and repeated best place to work winner, Assurance places coverage for all forms of business and personal insurance, employee benefits, and retirement services. So centrally local, uh, through central local offices just outside of Chicago, Illinois, and St. Louis, Missouri, more than 300 passionate insurance professionals provide measurable results and personalized services to thousands of clients across the country. Temporary employees tend to have a higher frequency of injury or illness. For that reason, in the staffing industry, employee onboarding is the first and most critical aspect of a successful safety program. In today's edition of our Industry Insider webinar series, Lauren will discuss the steps staffing firms can take during the employee onboarding process to minimize risk and ensure the safety of their employees while working for a host employer. Today we will cover the importance of quality employee onboarding, best practices for the application process, potential screening options, and training requirements for staffing companies. By the end of this session, you'll know the best practices staffing firms can implement to help ensure the safety of their employees. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Lauren. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thanks so much, everybody, for joining in on today's webinar. As Amanda mentioned, today we're going to be covering employee onboarding best practices and how to minimize risk. So as alluded to in the introduction, particularly with temporary staffing, it's a unique challenge to implement any kind of safety program, mostly due to a limited sense of control. So for a temporary staffing company, really there are two items that you have control over as your safety program, which is going to be client selection, so making sure that the employees you place are going to a safe environment prior to you sending them there. And then also the employee selection and onboarding process. So the steps that you take to ensure that employees you're hiring are quality employees, as well as the different training and items that you implement as part of the onboarding process, make sure that they're as prepared as possible prior to being sent out to that client location. So some of the key important items as far as onboarding goes. Number one really is going to be employee selection. So the better screening processes you have in place, the more screening options that you implement, the better higher quality hires you're going to get. Now even in some instances, you know, depending on the environment that you're placing them in, even if it's something like a general labor position or light industrial, it's just as important to make sure that the people you're putting in place are familiar with your safety policies, are willing to work safely and work with your safe work practices, as well as that you know, they are trustworthy and they fit with your overall company culture. 
also, the better employee selection process you have, the lower chances of turnover. Obviously, with temporary staffing, there's always going to be a level of turnover higher than what you would see at a, a regular four-walls facility. But the lower turnover you can get not only helps you as far as save time and efficiencies on your end and having to constantly try to re-recruit and replace people, but also build a better relationship with your clients overall. So the lower turnover, they know that they're getting quality people from you and that the employees that they do get from you, assuming that they're maybe not a short-term position but the longer term, they know that they will work out in the long run and therefore it can help build that partnership over years to come. Improved training procedures is also an important part of the onboarding process. So for staffing companies, although some of the job-specific training typically isn't covered by a staffing company overall, it still is important that the employees that are being sent out are still trained on your specific company procedures as well as general safety topics. Not all client safety orientations or even orientations in general are built evenly, so you want to make sure that you're at least providing a good foundation, a good baseline for employees prior to sending them out to wherever their destination may be. And then as I mentioned, it's safety culture. So safety culture within an organization can, can really vary depending on essentially how much time and effort has been put in and how long you've been around and how long your safety program has been established. Um, when you say safety culture, it's the feeling that, you know, amongst your employees, amongst your staff, that everyone is aware of what the safety program is and everyone is working towards the same end goal as far as safety goes. Safety culture isn't something that necessarily comes easy. I mean, it takes a, a lot of years and, and hard work to get that in place. But once you do, it can, your safety program can almost run itself. I mean, there's always going to be some tweaks and modifications over the year. But making sure that all of your employees know what your safety goals are, what your safety policies are, and everybody's working to achieve that same goal goes a long way in making sure that you have an effective safety culture in place. So really the first step when it comes to bringing on new employees is going to be the application process. Now it is pretty standard practice for everyone to have a written application as part of this process, but it's not actually always done surprisingly. So making sure that you do have that written application in place where employees are at least filling out their basic information as well as information about their background uh, is important to make sure that that's really the first step of the process overall. As far as the questions that you can ask, some of that's going to vary on a state-by-state -state basis, but essentially you're looking for just making sure that items on there aren't putting you in a place where it could potentially be said that you were discriminating against those potential applicants that had filled out an application. So after the application process, the next step is going to be an interview. <clears throat> Just in general, some general tips for interviewing overall is to make sure that you're paying attention to and really looking for red flags. Some that stand out that may not always be as obvious are going to be um, indifferent or disrespectful attitude. So if as they're talking, you can tell maybe they're not putting in any effort to the interview, or if when asked about certain items, they again seem indifferent or overall negatively, you wanna make sure that you're keeping track of that and making notes to make sure, because if they're acting like that during the interview process, which is typically when applicants are supposed to be putting on their very best face, how are they going to be once they get in front of a client or once they're not in front of you? So if they're already acting that way at that particular stage in the process, chances are that they're probably not going to be a good fit in the field either. Uh, speaking negatively of past employers, um, especially if you're talking to them about some of the past positions they've had and what went wrong, if they start going on a, a long story about something that their, their past employer did, that Maybe, maybe it was something that wasn't preferred, but uh, either way, they should maintain a respectful attitude throughout the interview process. So speaking negatively of a previous employer or previous coworkers or even previous positions can be a red flag for them as a candidate overall. And then aside from just listening to what they have to say, body language can be just in, as important in determining essentially how much effort they're putting into this particular interview. So people can say all the right things, but a lot of times body language can say a lot more than what you're verbalizing. So you wanna make sure that if you see a lot of um, 
lost eye contact. So if they have a hard time looking you in the eyes when you're actually talking to them, uh, crossed arms is, a, is another big one. Obviously, sometimes we'll just cross our arms if we're chilly, but other than that, um, a lot of times body language research has indicated that, you know, keeping your arms crossed during a conversation means that you're closed off, that you're not willing to listen to what the other person is saying. So again, if they're already doing that at this particular stage in the process, how well do you think they're going to act when they're not in front of their potential employer? So some of those just general red flags to look for in the, in the interview process. You wanna make sure that you're doing a thorough job. I know a lot of times with staffing, depending on the volume of employees you have coming in and out of the office, sitting down and doing a, you know, a 45 minute interview with every single person is likely not feasible. But just making sure that you are taking an appropriate amount of time to sit down and actually get to know the people as they're coming in and applying for these positions. So I know I, I've heard stories of some staffing companies that will do you know, a, a two minute interview for, for each person coming in. Unfortunately, a lot of times two minutes is really not a good amount of time to get an idea of the person that you're hiring and make sure that you're putting the effort into making sure you get a quality employee. So you wanna make sure that you're doing a thorough job and you're taking the appropriate amount of time to vet this person. As far as safety goes, don't be afraid to ask questions about safety experience at previous positions or even attitudes about safety overall. Um, asking about that during the interview process can go a long way to show how important safety is to you as an organization, as well as the fact that it is something that is going to be a continued focus and it is something that would potentially be enforced for them when they actually get into this position. So when conducting the interview, you wanna to try to do as many behavior-based interview questions as possible. So the behavior-based interview questions are going to be more of your open-ended questions. Um, so like, give me an example when a supervisor asked you to do something that was unsafe. Or tell me about a time when, again, you were asked to do something, but you thought there was a safer way to do it. Just putting a particular safety spin on those, but everybody has seen these questions before. I'm sure anybody who's been through an interview has also had these questions asked them before. Now, the reason that these questions are so important is because it really gives the potential candidate an opportunity to say in their own words how they feel about that particular topic. So aside from Safety. I mean, you can use these to talk about, you know, give me an example of when you had to work in a team. I know that's a really common one. Um, communication, again, you know, if they were asked to do something that they didn't feel was right, how did they react to that? Or even values. Um, all of these questions, um, particularly these behavior-based questions, are going to give you an idea of what that person has done in the past to give you a better sense of what they would do in a similar situation in the future. Now, obviously, there's always a chance that people aren't 100% honest during the interview process, so maybe what they say they're going to do isn't always what they actually will do. But at least if they're putting in the effort to come up with a story, give you an example, and try to demonstrate to you what kind of person they are, you'll get an overall better sense. And a lot of times when people are dishonest, you can start telling through that body language and some of those red flags talked about in the previous slide. So there are a lot of different screening options that are available for potential candidates. So we're gonna go through a lot of them today and then we can kind of give an overall of what each one does and what the purpose is. So starting off, probably the most common of all the employee screening options is going to be your pre-hired drug screen. So just some statistics from the US Department of Labor. Drug use by employees overall costs employers about $75 billion to $100 billion each year, just in lost time, accidents, healthcare, and workers' compensation costs. So that's a, a lot of money attributed to substance abuse issues with employees. About 65% of all workplace accidents are somehow related to drugs and alcohol. Maybe not always the actual cause. I mean, there's always going to be, when looking at the cause of an incident, there's typically, it's like roots of a tree, there's always going to be a lot of different contributing factors. But they're at least somewhat related to a drug and alcohol problem. And also, employees with substance abuse issues cause about 40% of all workplace accidents, which is a pretty frightening statistic because meaning that if 
we did a better job with pre-hire drug screens overall. These employers, particularly the ones without these programs in place, would have 40% less accidents than what they're currently having. A lot of times having an accident, even if it's proven that it's drug or alcohol related, because it's so hard to prove that that was the actual cause of the incident, in many states, I know in Illinois particularly, um, that's typically not a reason for denial of work comp benefits. So even if it is after, you know, the post-incident drug test is done, even if it comes back to show that they did have drugs in their system, they will still get benefits. So trying to eliminate the, the possibility of having an employee with substance abuse issues from the get-go is going to be more effective than just determining them after the fact or after an accident's happened, and unfortunately, after the claim has already occurred. There are a few different kinds of drug screens. Um, your standard five panel is going to test for marijuana, cocaine, PCP, opiates, and amphetamines. So really your most common types of illegal drugs is what that five panel is going to cover. Now there's also a 10 panel option for drug screening. Now the 10 panel typically also includes prescription drugs, which um, I know it's a lot more common use today than it used to be for people to, to abuse prescription drugs. So the 10 panel is definitely going to be your more thorough of the options. A lot of times the potential side effects from those prescription drugs can be just as devastating as the ones from the illegal drugs. So trying, if you were able to pinpoint that somebody had a potential issue with prescription drugs, again, it could it would really have the same benefit as it would determining if somebody has an illegal substance abuse issue. Uh, alcohol testing is another type of test available. Normally, alcohol testing is going to be time sensitive because obviously alcohol doesn't stay in your system as long as uh, prescription drugs do or illegal drugs. So alcohol testing isn't really widely used, um, typically because there's about a 24-hour window of when you're able to test for that, but it is a potential option that you would be able to do uh, at least post-offer. As far as getting these tests done, um, normally people opt to do clinic or in-house. Uh, typically with staffing, because you have such a high volume of employees coming in and out, I do see a lot of companies that opt for the in-house, which normally doesn't include the 10 panel, um, but as far as a cost-effective measure, it's, it's much more cost-effective than you're going to find from sending everyone to a clinic. Um, if you have a lower volume of employees, clinics typically can do a more thorough job, as well as the fact that um, clinics obviously are trained to do this. Now, if you set up an in-house program, you'll have to do some kind of training for the people that you're anticipating are going to be being administering this test, but you're going to have less of a chance of error at your clinic than you're probably going to have with an in-house program. Now, as far as timing goes for drug screens, normally it's going to be done um, pre-offer is, is most common, the reason being that if they can't necessarily pass the drug test to begin with, and that way you're not necessarily wasting your time with the rest of the screening process or the rest of the onboarding process. But with drug testing, pre op or post-hire tends to fall around really the, the same time frame, just making sure that they don't have these issues prior to bringing them on board. Now, there are some protections in place with the ADA when it comes to drug testing. So if somebody does test positively, you can make it your policy to allow them to reapply at some point, but best practice would be that you set up an established time frame. So let's say somebody were to apply and they were to fail the drug test, they would be able to reapply six months later and redo the drug test to show. You wouldn't want to do a short time frame with that, obviously, because they would be able to, depending on what the substance is and what the time frame is to get that substance out of your body, they would be able to just hold off or do a, a cleanse or something to get that out of their system for the next three days. That's not necessarily eliminating the problem. So if you are going to allow people to reapply in six months, even maybe have them bring in a certificate from some kind of rehabilitation or substance abuse issue program to show that they did go through this process as well as the fact that they're now able to provide you with a clean drug screen. Essential functions testing is specific to making sure that the person can physically do the job that you're placing them in. A lot of times essential function testing is 
is always done by a medical provider. I know some people have, um, they'll do it in-house where they'll have somebody demonstrate that they can lift so many pounds, but um, that can get a little tricky and it's not necessarily as scientific as the true essential functions test is. When you're sending someone in for an essential functions test, it's making sure that not only do they have the strength to do the tasks that you have in hand, but also the range of motion. Um, if your task calls for, let's say you have a job that calls for standing for eight hours and the ability to lift 30 pounds on an occasional basis, there are certain tests without having them actually stand for eight hours that can show the medical professional whether or not the person's physically capable of doing that specific job. Now, through this process, you can also identify pre-existing conditions given that because of privacy requirements, that isn't always necessarily given to you as the employer. It wouldn't necessarily be given to you as they're not able to do that job. But if you're able to eliminate a candidate based on the fact that they can't do the job at hand, that would be a potential option to make sure. Because there's, uh, unfortunately, a lot of candidates, particularly that they're really, really desperate for a job, that they'll say that they can lift 100 pounds 50 times a day when Physically, that's, that's not realistic, but people sometimes will say what they need to to make sure that they get the job at hand. So the essential functions test is essentially putting your money where your mouth is, making sure that they can actually physically do that job prior to them being placed in that position. It has to be done post-offer. It isn't something where you'd be able to just send somebody through or send every potential candidate through to get tested. Um, Normally, they have to have gone through the process, and then after you've made them the offer, the offer would be contingent on making sure that they can pass this essential functions test. And the other key element of the essential functions test is going to be an actual job description that, physic that lays out those physical requirements. So again, when you send someone to the medical professional to get an essential functions test done, they're looking at very specific items. So you want to make sure that that's outlined within the job description so that there's no potential for someone to come back and say that you discriminated. You know, you had a very set guide, clear guideline of what the physical parameters were for that position. If they didn't fill that position, maybe you have another position available for them that they could potentially take, but necessarily not just that one. Now, essential functions does tend to be one of the more costly of the screening measures, um, anywhere from about $40 to $50 per person, depending on the relationship you have set up or how close the nearest clinic is, if it's a clinic or a hospital. But uh, so maybe not always feasible for a staffing company to do this for every single candidate coming in the door, but at least for those positions that are going to be more labor intensive, essential functions is a great way to make sure that you're minimizing that risk prior to sending somebody to that position. Background tests. Um, with staffing, obviously I-9 is going to be your most common and that's one that's going to be required across the board. There are other optional tests when it comes to background checks. So a criminal background check, now that can be done either on a state or a federal level. Um, some states have programs set up where you can just do that for free online. Others you would normally have to go through a background check company and have it done as a fee. Now, criminal background checks, you want to make sure, obviously, that you have parameters in place as far as what's acceptable and what's not. Um, a lot of times, staffing companies will just go based on what their client location is, and if they're only testing for those particular positions, um, they can still get a little dicey because depending on where you're placing the person, if you're not placing them at that client and you can place them somewhere else, again, with all screening options, what your the underlying concern is always going to be discrimination. So whatever your policy is, just making sure it's applied clearly across the board and making sure it's actually consistently done that way. References and past employment checks. Um, a lot of times that you get these reference checks, you wanna make sure that you actually are calling and verifying. Now, as far as the information that previous employers can give you, it tends to be more minimal. So if they, you know, if you were to talk to somebody and they were to really, really go on a really long rant about how terrible of an employee this was, um, that could potentially be putting them in hot water. Um, but the same thing, you know, it could be potentially detrimental to you as a company if you're not at least making the effort to check into these employees prior to placing them. So a lot of times with, um, 
like criminal background checks and sometimes even with references and background checks, you're going to be looking at, um, aside from your, your standard HR issues, which are going to be like attendance, things like that, um, also workplace violence uh, with criminal background checks, that tends to be a big one. If you're going to be placing an employee anywhere where they have a potential to encounter children, um, the sex offender list would be a good check for that as well because, again, if you were to place somebody in a location like that <clears throat> without having done the proper background, obviously they're going to be the ones ultimately to get in trouble, but you could also potentially be on the hook for negligent hiring. Credit checks aren't as common overall for a background test. Um, there's not going to be a, a lot of positions that really require you to have stellar credit to actually do that job. And a lot of times with these employee screenings, again, you as the employer are just trying to make sure that the employee you have is the best fit, not necessarily that they have the best credit. A lot of times credit checks are used if you're placing someone in a financial position. So if they're going to be placed somewhere um, like a bank or like a currency exchange or something like that where they would actually be handling money on a regular basis, that's more commonly where you see credit checks used. And then workers' compensation history. It is available overall as a background check, but it is a very, very slippery slope. Um, you can't not hire someone just based on the fact that they have a work comp claim in their background. Now, if they have a work comp claim that means that they have a bad back and now they can't do the job at hand, um, that would have been identified through an essential functions test. And by going the essential functions route, that's going to cover you a lot better than trying to show the train of thought of how you came from their work comp claim history to why you can't hire them now. Uh, I have seen some companies do it, but as I mentioned, um, it's a real, I would recommend definitely to proceed with caution if you do decide to do that, because as I mentioned, you can be potentially getting yourself in some trouble there when it comes to discrimination if you choose not to hire someone purely based off the fact that they've had a work comp claim. Integrity tests look for honesty, dependability, uh, trustworthiness, reliability. So essentially all of the character qualities that you look for in a, a person, that's really what the integrity test is meant to measure. Now, it's normally a combination of direct and indirect questions. Now, the direct questions will ask you something like, uh, if you were to find money, um, that, or would you report a work comp claim that wasn't real? Um, so that's going to be a direct example where they'll specifically ask the question, and then some are going to be a little bit less direct. So case where um, if you had hurt your back playing soccer over the weekend, would you report that to your employer on Monday? It's not directly asking them if they would report a fraudulent claim, but obviously if they said yes, they're saying that they would. So. They're normally a combination of those two questions on integrity tests. Um, some integrity test companies have said that they're able to provide just as efficient results as a pre-hire drug screen as well, because they do have questions set up normally within the integrity test to show if anybody has potential substance abuse issues as well. Now, the whole reason behind the integrity test is they're hoping that by identifying these characteristics and traits in people, particularly the ones that you're really looking for in employees and the ones that you're looking to avoid with employees, by identifying those at the beginning, you're able to get a higher quality of employee overall. A lot of times integrity testing is done even before the interview process even starts because that way if they're not able to make it through what you've set up for that integrity test, you won't even bother taking them in for the interview process, thus saving the time of, of you and your staff to actually have to go through the rest of the onboarding process. Um, surprisingly, even with some of those direct questions, in my experience, you'd be really surprised at how many people won't answer these questions honestly. Now, while is it, it probably is a good character trait that they're honest, um, to honestly admit that you have a substance abuse issue or that you would submit a fraudulent claim uh, probably isn't the best employee to join your organization. And personality testing, so whereas integrity testing, again, is more looking at uh, trustworthiness, dependability, personality testing just is more making sure that they would fit into your, the culture of your company as well as the specifics of the position at hand. 
So looking at things such as interpersonal, interpersonal interactions, um, satisfaction with different work aspects, so essentially what motivates them, uh, as well as how they deal with uh, teamwork, how they handle stress, things like that. So a lot of these different personality traits, again, depending on what the specific culture of your company is, you can have employees screen to make sure that they would be a good fit. If you, for example, have a position where you know the employee is going to be working in a team at all times, if you have them do a personality test and it comes back that they are, they don't like working in teams, they really prefer to work alone, um, they don't work well with others, then they're not necessarily going to be a great fit for that position. And that's really what the personality test is in place to assess. Motor vehicle record reviews. So motor vehicle record reviews are going to be specific to people that are either being placed in a position where they're going to be driving or even for your own employees, your own staff employees that are going to be driving on company business. So a lot of times you'll have uh, potentially managers or supervisors that have to drive to different client locations, or you could be placing someone that will be just driving for their job overall. Making sure that they have a good motor vehicle record can be a good way to make sure that their instance or their chance of having an accident is going to be lower than you would find elsewhere. Normally with MVR reviews, they're typically done initially upon hire, and then best practices to redo those at least once a year. Um, some states, like California, has a program in place where if somebody were to get a ticket or a citation after um, they've been registered as being with your company, that they will provide you with a notification. But a lot of states don't have that, so you could run an MVR on somebody on a Monday, they could get a ticket on a Wednesday, and until you ran that MVR again, unless they came to you and admitted it, you wouldn't know. So you want to make sure that you are running them on a regular basis. Obviously, you don't need to go crazy and do it on a weekly basis, but at least on an annual basis is best practice. Typically, the policy is going to set up what's acceptable for an MVR and what isn't. There isn't necessarily a standard as far as what's acceptable and what isn't. It's really going to be up to you. You do have some discretion on that. Normally, it's going to depend. So there is an example here of a table. So depending on the number of at-fault accidents in the last three years, you know, if they've had one at-fault accident or three violations as a result of one at-fault accident in the last three years, then that's going to be denied. They're not going to be able to drive on company business. Now, the reason why, this, aside from your potential auto policy, even if people are driving their own vehicles, if they're driving their own vehicles on company business and they were to get into an accident, that will potentially or likely be your work comp claim. So again, people with better driving behaviors or better driving records are going to be less likely to get into an accident than somebody that has a poor record. Now, after you have screened the employee and brought them on board, the next step is going to be training them. So just some generals as far as employee orientation training goes. Normally, training is going to be a combination of some kind of visual audio training as well as written rules. So the reason why some people will just do written rules, but unfortunately, depending on the potential candidates that you have, number one, not everyone's reading level or reading comprehensions are going to be the same. So just providing a written rules or written handouts isn't always going to be the most effective method to make sure that they're actually reading and comprehending what's being presented to them. A lot of times by having that visual audio, so either, again, somebody's either walking them through the different policies or they're watching some kind of video, having a combination of that with the written rules is going to be the best method to make sure that they're actually paying attention to what's being presented to them. And then also having a quiz. So having a quiz to make sure that they actually do comprehend it and you can have that in your file as documentation. Now, normally you would want to keep a reference copy as a takeaway. So it's not like, you know, once they've gone over these rules with you and they've walked out, you know, they could potentially forget things. Um, I wish that we could all remember everything we said from the second we learned it to forever. But sometimes you do need something as a reference point. So by providing them some kind of reference copy or some kind of takeaway, they can bring that back with them. And if they do have questions in the past, they'll have that moving forward. Now, the key is just making sure that you do have documentation overall. 
Um, most commonly for an orientation is going to be like a signed acknowledgement form, which will just be something relatively basic outlining that says, um, you know, I did receive these handouts, I did watch this training, and I acknowledge that these are the rules in place and that I will follow them. If not, I could be potentially subject to a discipline policy. Um, even sometimes a quiz, if you do administer a quiz, that could be used as documentation because, again, if it says on the quiz that it's correlating to the training you did and they have to sign off that they were the ones that completed that quiz, you would have that documentation on file to indicate that you did put them through some kind of training. Now, with documentation as far as safety goes, so aside from just having it in your own records in case there's any questions moving forward, as far as a regulatory standpoint, so OSHA goes, um, in the eyes of OSHA, if it's not documented, it didn't happen at all. So you want to make sure that you do have that documentation on file to show that you did your due diligence on your end and that you did present them with at least some general training prior to sending them out to whatever their assignment was. Some items that the general orientation would normally cover. So first up would be your specific company policies. So what your discipline program is, um, is that your progressive discipline is going to be your most common. So uh, either a, a three-step program, so the three strikes are out rule. Um, there's also a, a four-step where it's normally verbal, then written, then suspension, then termination. Uh, whatever your discipline policy is, you normally want to make sure that that's included as part of the general orientation process and then it's outlined so that they're familiar with it. And as you do actually apply the discipline policy, that they are familiar with it and they can't come back and say that they had no idea it was in place. Um, return to work is always an important item to cover as well, making sure that employees understand that if they are injured, that you do have a modified duty or return to work program. Uh, return to work programs are really one of the most essential items in keeping your overall cost of claims down, because as you have somebody back on modified duty, the overall cost of that claim is going to come down substantially since you're not paying them for that indemnity time. But making sure that people understand that they're going to be expected to do modified duty can go a long way to making sure that you're discouraging maybe some of that more fraudulent behavior. So in case somebody thinks that they're able to just come in and get injured, then you'll just let them be off of work for the next six months to let them know that that's not the case with your company. Um, prohibited activities. So if there are any specific activities that you don't allow employees to do, you wanna make sure those are outlined. And make sure that those are communicated clearly because a lot of times for temporary staffing, once the temporary employee leaves your office and gets to the client location, you don't necessarily have a real frequent communication with them unless you have a kind of on-site supervisor or a schedule in place that you're visiting them on a regular basis. So the only way you're gonna know if they're being asked to do things that you don't want them to do, that they are prohibited to do, is by letting them know what those prohibited activities are and asking them to report that back to you. So making sure that that's outlined, and then incident reporting as well. So making sure that they understand the timeframes in place for how soon they have to report an incident if one occurs, and making sure that they understand that there would be discipline applied if that timeframe is not followed. A lot of times also with incident reporting, if you do have that post-incident drug test involved uh, program that's already established, letting them know that during the orientation process can also go a long way towards discouraging some of those fraudulent claims. And then also the orientation should provide baseline safety training on some general topics. So uh, general safety items is just going to be um, talking about like housekeeping, work areas, um, just what you do for like safe work behaviors, you know, to report concerns as you see them, you know, don't walk by a spill, always make sure you clean it up. Personal protective equipment, a lot of times, depending on, I guess, the variety of clients that you're placing people at, if the PPE is going to be different across the board, so let's say one client requires safety glasses, one does hard hats, one does respirators, what you would be expected to train on would, necessarily, would just be to really understand what personal protective equipment is and that they're expected to wear and maintain whatever is provided to them and what's required for them to wear. Um, the training on the specific actual PPE they'll be wearing, that should be done on a client level. And then hazard communication, again, uh, hazard communication is going to be specific to chemical safety. So on your end, you would want to make sure that they understand what hazard communication is, um, how to read a safety data sheet, how to read a chemical label, 
And then on the client side, they would be expected that they would go over the chemicals that they're expected to encounter and what those specific hazards are. So after the, the general training has been done, uh, there should be some job specific training specific again to the position that they're going to be placed in. Now, again, a lot of this is going to vary depending on actual client and placement. So some cases I know in temporary staffing, the clients will provide you with a job specific or a facility specific training that you as a staffing firm can administer. Uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you just, you do your general training and then you would send them and hope that the client has a, a strong orientation in place. Verifying that the client has some kind of job specific training should be done as part of that client evaluation process. Now, if you wanted to go above and beyond the general training that's required as a staffing company, there you could potentially put together some industry specific handouts. And then you would just do those for the industries that you commonly place. So for example, if you if it's really common or most of your clients are all in healthcare. So you could probably develop some specific healthcare training on top of your general that would still cover a majority of all employees of a company or yours. Just to, so for like healthcare would be um, like safe patient handling or bloodborne pathogens, uh, having communications big in there as well. So just making sure that you're providing just an extra level of training, again, to raise that awareness and help build some of that safety culture. There are some items that have to be done on a client specific level. And most of those are actually going to fall more into the light industrial or industrial range. So uh, forklifts is an example. So even if you have an employee that has 10 years of experience driving a forklift, uh, the forklift regulations require that they have to be recertified or reauthorized by the client on the actual forklift they're going to be driving in, in that facility. So just because you, you know, somebody has a forklift certification from a previous position doesn't mean that that carries on because it's specific to the actual equipment they're operating and, again, the environment they're operating it in. Uh, lockout tagout, which is making sure that once you're performing maintenance on a machine that people can't accidentally turn it back on while that maintenance is being done, that's going to be another real specific training because it's being done on a specific machine and that specific procedure. So that's also something that should be done, again, on a client level. And then after you sent the employee off to their new position, you want to try to establish a schedule to make sure that you're checking in with them. The reason why a lot of times the injury rate is so much higher for temporary employees is because they're always a new employee, particularly if you have those employees that aren't going to a long-term position, if they're jumping from position to position just because the actual placements are short-term. So you want to make sure that you're checking in with them and checking in to see how everything's doing. So gauging morale, asking how they like the position, is it what you expected? Um, is there anything that was unexpected? Did they ask you to do anything that we hadn't already talked to you about? Uh, as well as safety information. A lot of times, again, when you're vetting out a client, you can get a lot of information from them. But similar to when you're looking at a potential candidate, Sometimes clients aren't necessarily truthful about what their process is, and not necessarily because they're trying to mislead you. Maybe the person that your contact is that you're meeting with isn't as familiar with the safety program as someone else would be. So getting that information from the employees can give you a lot of insight as far as how the safety program is actually running at that specific location. So making sure they did get that job-specific training, um, making sure they were issued PPE if you were expecting the client to do it on their end, and then if they have any safety concerns, if they've been asked to do anything that they consider is unsafe, um, the environment, things like that, just trying to gather as much information as you can to give you as much insight and make sure that the employee that you've now spent your time and money screening and onboarding, making sure that they're in a safe environment and hopefully will be able to work injury-free. So that is the presentation on employee onboarding best practices. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. You know, as Amanda mentioned, there is a Q&A feature as well as a chat feature. I do have a couple of questions that have come in, so um, go ahead and continue to enter in any questions that you have, and we'll start with the first question. 
With all the screening options available, what are the most important ones to have in place? Typically, the, the very most important of the screening options is going to be that drug screen. Just because drugs, uh, potential substance abuse issues can contribute so much to potential accidents or, or safety issues on the job. So making sure that the drug screen is actually being done across the board is going to be your most important screening measure overall. Okay. And uh, would general safety video meet the requirements for a new higher orientation training? So that's a, a pretty common practice in, in staffing overall. Um, a lot of times what people will do is, uh, you, know, you, can, you can find them online, there's a lot of general safety orientations or it'll just say new higher safety orientation videos and that's what people will use. Um, and they can vary anywhere. I've seen some that are as short as 10 minutes. I've seen some go as long as 40 minutes. And the, what they'll do is for every person coming on, they'll just show them that general video. So a lot of times the general videos do cover a lot of the items that would be required of a general safety training for a new employee. The only issue sometimes with these general videos is going to be that because they're you know, a, a video that you're just purchasing off the shelf, you have no room to really customize. So let's say, for example, um, as an organization, let's say you don't allow ladder use. So you prohibit your employees from using ladders. If you were to, a lot of these general safety videos are going to include a section on ladders, as an example. So you have no ability to go back and edit and change those materials because essentially they are presented to you as is. So that's only, and you don't get to include any of your own company specific policies as well. So it will cover some of the basic safety items, but I would still recommend having something more customized in addition to that. Okay. Um, it is my understanding that you can ask medical questions, but after they are hired, a post medical questionnaire. My understanding is also you cannot ask about work comp claims. Are you saying that you can check it though? Correct. So the post medical questionnaire has become more common overall instead of these essential function tests, specifically because those essential function tests are so costly, again, with the volume of employees that you're looking at in the staffing industry. So post medical questionnaires have been or post-offer medical questionnaires have become more common overall. So for anyone who's not familiar with post-offer medical questionnaire, it's essentially just a list of medical questions about their current physical state. So rather than sending them to a doctor, you're having them fill this out and having them certify from there, just from their answers on that sheet, that they are able to physically perform the job at hand. Um, there are a lot of companies that do provide work comp. You can't specifically ask on there if they've ever had a work comp claim. You can ask about pre-existing conditions or pre-existing injuries. Um, you, there is background, in a lot of the background companies today, they do offer a work comp history check. But again, you're not allowed to necessarily use that in the actual hiring process. So how much good it does for you in the end is, is pretty minimal. Because again, you can't hire, can't not hire somebody based on the fact that they have that work comp claim. Okay. What the, 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 what the medical questionnaire is, I'll just clarify, it's post-offer, not post-hire. I apologize for that. So you would have them fill out that medical questionnaire post-offer, and if it comes up in the medical questionnaire and that they cannot perform some of, like, one of the tasks at hand or whatever it may be, your options would be to either deny them for that position based on the fact that they physically can't do it, or you'd have to try to find them in an alternate position. Okay, so if something comes up in the medical questionnaire that's of concern, would you have already yeah, so, hired them? Or no, you're saying no. that that's when you have the opportunity to either offer them a different position or not proceed with giving them that particular position because they weren't able to meet some of the requirements? Correct. Okay. Lauren, in your experience, um, is there an, an overall um, 
best practice that you see clients providing or um, steps that, that you wish they would have taken when you see um, some of the work comp claims that, that clients are experiencing? Um, honestly, the, the most common issue I, I see as far as onboarding goes is temporary staffing. Um, and, and some of it will depend on what exactly they're staffing. I know sometimes if, uh, if you're a staffing company that I use healthcare professionals again. Um, normally, those companies will put more time into the employee onboarding process than you would get from a staffing company that's maybe doing um, like light industrial or general labor. So a lot of times, but really the onboarding process should be thorough across the board regardless of what position that you're placing. Now, obviously, if you're doing some kind of like executive placement, you may even go above and beyond what would be your standard practice. But normally what I see that the, the biggest issue is is that a lot of times people are, as I mentioned, that like two-minute interview. Because there's such a volume of people coming in and they're just looking to essentially fill bodies into positions rather than taking the time to make sure that they're actual quality candidates, I find that a lot of staffing companies don't spend a lot of time on the onboarding process and actually making sure that they do thorough checks of the candidates that are coming in. Okay, that's great advice. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put up uh, the contact information. If anyone has any additional questions or would like more information, uh, you can certainly reach out to Lauren directly or you can reach out to me and see if I can um, help you or um, pass you along to the appropriate person who can answer your questions. I, again, I thank everyone for uh, participating in today's webinar. And, and certainly, Lauren, for sharing all your knowledge about best practices for employee onboarding. The recording of the webinar will be available on TRICOM's website at TRICOM.com, and it will be under the Resources and Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation, and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.